Hi guys, welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to talk about dominance. So I will say in your um, coloring book, there is a nice um, section here, section 47 in my book, but just look in your index to make sure it's the same as in yours, um, that talks about female dominance and energetics. Um, for the most part, the vast majority of this lecture is going to be focused on female dominance. Um, I am going to include a TED Talk from Franz Duvall here in this module that's going to discuss chimpanzees um, a little bit more in depth in terms of their dominance and hierarchy styles. So I think it's um, it's a great video. It really it's really great, um, and it relates the chimpanzee dominance dominance in politics, if you will, to even human politics, which I think is a very interesting contrast. So, um, so today we're going to talk about dominance and a few different things. Again, the 90% of this lecture is going to be on female dominant groups. So thinking like our macaques, our capuchins, um, our, who else? Uh, <laughs> I'm just blinking. So it's not going to talk about, um, like our gorillas. It's not going to talk about our chimpanzees. We're talking about big group dynamics like macaques, capuchins, squirrel monkeys, things like that, that are going to live in large, robust, multi-male, multi-female groups. Okay, so there's a couple concepts that we're going to talk about, and I'm going to use this as a reference. And this first one here is, um, we're going to break this down to our ecological resources. We're going to talk about inter versus intra group competition. So again, we have inter with an E, an intra with an A. This is hugely important, okay? If I ask you to describe in an exam something about intra group competition and you give me inter, it's going to be wrong. So make sure you guys are really understanding which one is inter and which one is intra, okay? So let's take a look at inter group competition. Um, intergroup is between two groups, okay? Um, so I am group A and you are group B. Let's look at this, okay? Group A and just writing that down. A and B, okay? We're two different groups. We're separate groups. Let's think of these as, let's think of these as maybe our Japanese macaques because we saw, oh, you know, our capuchins because we saw a great video about capuchin competition, right? Between two groups, okay? So a group may have high or low inter-group competition. Um, so that might mean, depending on my food source, my resources, my ecology, it might be that I am in heavy competition with the neighboring group for a particularly great and ripe stand of fruit trees, okay? So we are competing against each other very heavily, right? We may have fighting, skirmishes, howls, like all of those things because we're trying to gain ground from each other, right? We're trying to get access to that food resource. It's really important to us to do that. Now, there's the difference between um, condensed and spotty food resources. So if I have patchy food resources, you know what, I'm not even going to draw that. I have patchy food resources, right? So I might have, let's talk about, you know, 100 acres that two different groups share. And food resources might be patchy throughout it, right? It doesn't make sense for me to be in competition with the group next to me because we can all just pretty easily move around that area to get those food resources, right? And it's going to be really hard for me to defend any one of them because they're so spread out, okay? Now, if we have a condensed food resource where in that 100 acres, 
there's maybe one or two areas that fruit consistently. We're going to be in more competition, right? Because we could potentially defend those fruit trees because they're very close together. Okay. So it's the idea of, is the food resource patchy or condensed and is it defendable? Okay. So we did talk about that in here. So that's going to determine if we have high intergroup competition or low intergroup competition. So if the food source is condensed and defendable, we might have high competition. If it's pass, patchy and dispersed, dispersed, we might have low intergroup competition. Okay. Intergroup competition is the competition between two different groups. Now we have the idea of intra-group competition. So intra-group competition is the competition with the individuals within your own group. Okay. So the competition inside your group. So again, this is going to go back to resources. If there is an abundance of resources and everybody in the group has access to them and there's no worry about them being enough to feed the group, you're going to have low competition within your group. Okay. But if those resources are a scarcer, right? If there's not as many of them, um, your dominant animals are going to want access to them first, right? And if you're on the low end of the dominant scale, you're going to have the least amount of access. So again, resources are going to be high to low. So you might have no competition within your group, okay? Um, or you might have really high competition within your group. It's all going to depend on your access to the resource, okay? So for females, it's always food, okay? For females, it is 100% food. That's the only thing they're thinking of. Fruit trees, if you're like a capuchin or something like that, that's all they care about, right? So are you competing with the group next to you? And are you competing within your group? Okay. And it's all going to have to do with your access to resources. For males, it's all about access to females. I and mean, Fran Sabal will talk about this in his video. Um, males will go weeks or days without eating if there is an estrus female around. <laughs> and that's a direct quote from Franz. Um, so again, your resources are either going to be food or mating. And for females, it's always food. Okay. So that is your intra, inter, sorry, versus intra. Now we have this idea here. We have a despotic or egalitarian. That's your style of dominance. So one capuchin group may be a different style than another capuchin group. It's all going to depend on their access to resources. So what does despotic mean? So if you guys have read, it's been very popular in YA or young adult um, literature for the past decade or so. Um, the Hunger Games, Divergent, um, I'm trying to think, uh, oh, Maze Runner. Those are all concepts around a despotic future, right? where there is a like a fascist regime or like the handmaiden's tale okay those are all despotic okay egalitarian would be the opposite right where everybody is sort of equal and um, there's equity and everything is very peaceful okay so we have within our primates two different dominant styles despotic and egalitarian okay those are all going to have to do with their competition. Okay. So, um, in a despotic dominant style, what you'll see is if I'm the alpha animal, right? I'm the higher ranking animal. Everything that you do as a subordinate that is out of line, in my opinion, would be recognized, right? I would give you a threat. Now, typically it's a mild threat because we don't need to be very aggressive, right? Because in a despotic society, everybody knows their place. So as the alpha animal, I might give you a threat face. So I always think about this in the way of like, you know, I think as kids, we would all go shopping with our moms. And if we weren't acting right, you know, the mom face, the like your mom doesn't need to say anything. 
She doesn't need to make a big deal out of it because you know when she gives you that look that you're in trouble, <laughs> right? So you stop acting up in theory. <laughs> that's what that's supposed to do. So she's letting you know, she's signaling to you that you better stop or you're going to be in big trouble. So in a despotic society, as, the, as a dominant animal, I'm always putting you in your place, okay? And I don't need to do so very aggressively because you know enough that my threat face is telling you to stop doing something or it's going to get bad. But in a despotic society, it rarely gets bad, right? There's rarely really aggressive, like, um, shows of dominance because everybody knows their place so well and everybody's put in their place so often that we don't necessarily need to be um, physical. So you'll see in a despotic um, primate group that every infraction is acknowledged with a threat. Okay. And when things do go to blows, so if you didn't pay attention, okay, if you didn't pay attention to my threats and now I'm chasing after you to give you a bite to put you in your place, we don't reconcile after. Okay. Um, so after that happens, we both go to our separate areas and we move on with our day. That's important. That's huge. We don't reconcile. Because as the alpha, I don't feel the need to tell you that I'm sorry. You were out of line. I put you in your place. Um, egalitarian is a little bit different. So in an egalitarian, let me just hold that up for you so you guys want to write that down. Egalitarian. Um, in an egalitarian society, I let a lot of infractions go as the alpha. If it's small, I tend to, I tend to ignore it. If it's a little infraction, I don't do very much about it. Um, I just kind of like let it go. I let, I let a lot of things go as the dominant animal. However, if you do something so out of line that I need to address it, it's very severe. So when I do address your infraction, it's very, very severe. Okay, it's important. But after that, I will come back to you fairly quickly and make amends, right? We'll reconcile. So I might have just beaten the crap out of you because you've gone past the line too many times, but I'm going to come back to you fairly quickly within maybe five minutes or so, and we're going to groom and we're going to like comfort each other and we're going to restore the peace because the peace is very important okay so in a despotic society every infraction is enforced we don't see a lot of high levels of physical aggression and there's but when it happens there's not there's no reconciliation okay egalitarian small infractions are overlooked or ignored Big infractions are enforced very heavily, very aggressively, but we reconcile fairly quickly, okay? So I want to make sure you guys understand the difference between the two of those. If you need to go back and replay that, please do. It's an important concept, and it will be asked about. <laughs> I guarantee it. Okay, so how does ecology play a role in this? Don't look at these down here. That'll be next. Okay. So if I have high intergroup competition, meaning that my group, okay, our awesome class, right, is competing with the class next door, um, I need to make sure that you're going to be there when I need you to be there, okay? So we tend, what, so what dominant style do you think that would be, okay? High intergroup competition between groups. So it's going to be more despotic, right? Because it's going to be sort of more military precision. I'm going to need to make sure you know where your place is and that you're there to back me up when I need it. 
Okay, so we have high competition between groups. If we're not really worried about other groups coming and getting our food, if we've kind of got more than enough, more like what we need, we're going to be more egalitarian, right? Because everybody just do your own thing, right? It's a little bit more like, ah, eh, we're living in a land of plenty. We can be a little bit more loosey goosey. So what we tend to see in primates is that, and it seems a little bit counterintuitive, but when you need to be competitive against a neighboring group, it tends to be more despotic, right? Because it needs, everybody needs to know their place. It needs to know their place quickly to support the group against competitors. With an egalitarian, where your group has everything it needs and it doesn't really need to compete with another group, we tend to be more egalitarian, right? Because we're not asking for help as often. So, you know, if our subordinates are kind of stepping out of line a little bit here and there, we don't need to put them in their place because, you know, it's not as big a deal. We're only going to do something if it's really egregious. So think about that in human societies. When do cultures tend to shift towards a more despotic or more fascist rule? So that shift tends to happen when your leaders in human cultures create this idea of a conflict with an outside source. Okay, so I think a really easy and obvious example is if we talk about World War II. Inside of Germany, right, there was the idea that Germans were the best, genetically, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Genetically descended Germans were better than those on the outside who had taken part of their land, right? So it was a nationalist or a populist, right? Um, call, like, we are proud Germans, we want what is due to us. So it became fascist, it became despotic. Um, so there's the outside, but there was also an internal, again, um, the idea that those of Jewish heritage were taking away from those who were Germans, okay? So you can see how this idea of competition would if we feel that there is a big um, or a large amount of competition pressuring us from the outside, you can see why this move towards a despotic um, social style would be accepted, right? Because you have a very specific and distinct role to play, okay? Everybody has their place. So while we go through some of this stuff in class, I do want you to think about how these primate theories relate to what's happening in human politics. Franz will get into that in his TED talk as well. So definitely watch that. Um, so I do want to talk about how females in these groups, uh, how we measure their dominance. Okay. So I just folded that top down so it wasn't going to get in our way. So we have two groups. Female, female A is our alpha female. She's our most dominant female. Okay, female B ranks below her. Her family ranks below her. So what's really important to know is that female A and all of her offspring, so these are her daughters, the lowercase a, b, and c. These are some of her granddaughters, one, two, three. Every individual in A's family will outrank every individual in B's family. So we are talking about the females, right? Because in these female dominant societies, they stay in their natal groups for life. So right now we're not talking about males at all. So we've got female A and all of her offspring and female B and all of her offspring. So A's are all above B's in the dominance hierarchy. The other thing that's important to know is this is your birth order. So female A is the firstborn. We've got B, a middle daughter, and C, the youngest daughter. Females inherit a rank below their mother. Oops. So they're never going to outrank their mother. That's important to know. But they inherit their rank in reverse birth order. 
So if we think about humans and like um, how royalty inherits rank, it's always like that firstborn child. It's the opposite, okay? It's going to be the youngest. So the youngest female is always going to have the highest rank. They inherit their rank in reverse birth order. And that would make sense if we talk about kin selection. So a female is going to spend the most time in close proximity with her youngest offspring, right? So if there's a conflict, she's always going to support her youngest first because that's the baby. So if dominance is based on how much support that you're getting, C is always going to get more support than B or A, okay? So C and all her daughters will outrank B and all of her daughters and A and all. And so again, this is going to inherit in reverse birth order. So sometimes we will see groups split. So ecologically speaking, there's only so many primates that can live in a group and that group able to sustain itself. The population density, once it becomes too high, you're going to see that group split apart. What you'll typically see is that happen along a matriline. So A would split because it would make sense, right? Because she's never going to outrank her younger sisters. So A would leave with all of her daughters and granddaughters and great granddaughters if there are some. So her entire family would split and leave if there was a population density issue and they needed that group needed to split up. So they're always going to stay in that natural line. So that's how females inherit rank. Um, it is pretty stringent. Okay. It is birth order. You know, when an infant is born, what her rank is going to be in that group. Um, very rarely will they change group or change rank. And when it does happen, it might happen somewhere where it's a little bit more nebulous where like the lowest ranking of all of A's family and like the highest ranking of all of B's might be in. So it's like an adjacent position. So they're not going to typically jump if they do change their um, rank order, like many spaces, it might be one or even two at the most. So again, it's very strict, that dominant hierarchy based on birth order. Um, with males, it's a little bit different. So again, we're going to talk about the males of these groups. So let's stay with our capuchins. We're not talking about our chimpanzee. Um, so still in female dominant societies, males are going to leave their natal group when they're sexually mature. They, and then they will transfer groups or emigrate every few years. When they enter a new group, their dominance is going to be based on tenure. So as a new male, I'm going to be the lowest ranking of the males in that group. Okay. Uh, if I've been in that group, maybe three or four years, I might, I will be have higher rank. Okay. So it's all based on tenure um, for males ranks within the group. And what a higher tenure gives you. So as the alpha male of a group, I'm not in control of the group, right? The females are in control of the group. What I'm in control of, my resource, is females. So I'm going to be able to conspicuously copulate, which means when my females go into estrus, I'm going to have first access to them, and I'm going to have access to them in full view of the group, okay? Like, I'm going to be able to mate with who I want when I want, typically. Um, that's your benefit to being a high-ranking male in a group, is your access to females. You can conspicuously copulate. Low-ranking males have to woo females away, have to be a little bit more secretive, right, because they don't want those dominant males to see them and beat them up. So low-ranking males will still copulate. They'll still have sex with estrous females, but they'll do it in a much more clandestine way. The other important thing to know is that female mate choice plays a huge role. So we'll dive into this a lot more in males in mating strategies, but just know 
that just because the dominant male can mate in full view of everyone, like he doesn't have to worry about competition, I'm probably as a female going to be more drawn to the new male, right? Because he's novel. He's the novel male bringing new genes in. So I might likely be wooed and go off and mate with a newer male um, in a clandestine or, or sneaky way. So female dominance in these female philopatric societies is birth rank and order, and they are pretty easy to, um, to anticipate, okay? Whenever a new infant comes in, you know exactly where they rank. Males is going to be based on tenure, typically, so when they've entered their new group. Um, when we talk about our male dominant societies, you'll see that that's a little bit different. I'm going to let Franz handle that because I think his TED Talk does a really great job. Um, the other thing to know is kinship selection is obviously hugely in play, right? For this, it would make sense that females would support their sisters, their offspring, their granddaughters, right? That we would support our kin. It also does play a role in males, even though they leave their um, natal groups. They'll often emigrate with a brother, okay, or another close relative. And that helps them... Um, have support when they're leaving groups. That's a very stressful situation. So they have support of their kin. Um, they support each other, right? If there's any skirmishes or fights and they just have somebody that they know, right? That's a comfort. So even though males leave their natal groups, you will often see them when they emigrate to new groups, do so with a brother or another close relative. Okay. Um, so I'm going to end this video here. And then you guys, please watch the TED Talk from Franz um, so that you guys can understand a little bit more about chimpanzees and how those groups work. Um, and if you have any questions, as always, email me. You guys have the discussion group. There's the discussion question, but don't forget there's that raise your hand section or ask a question section where you guys can just pose questions to the group. So please utilize that. Um, and I will see you guys in the next video.